So this afternoon, I'm going to talk about spiritual growth. Um, let's put my next. And I'm going to try and do a three-part way of approaching it. The first is talking about the systems that are involved in change. The second is to talk about factors that help and hurt the change process. And then I want to talk to you about some concrete strategies and tools that you can use to facilitate the change process. Um, but I want, as I did before, to start with a caveat. And I love Thomas Aquinas, and I love this quote in particular from the Summa. Since therefore grace does not destroy nature, but perfects it, natural reason should minister to the faith as the natural bent of the will ministers to charity. So beautiful. There could be a whole talk on just that. But why I put it here is my hope is to simply offer you psychological insights that you can use to minister with. It is beyond my domain and my scope to really talk competently about what spiritual growth looks like. So I'm going to offer you a perspective about human growth, psychological growth, behavioral change. And my hope is that you can take those insights and the other insights that you gain from this conference to use those as ministers to the larger process of facilitating and accompanying people in their spiritual growth, spiritual process. So with that, there's the large question of how do people change? And coming back a little bit to my role, a large part of what I do all week is I teach um, doctoral students how to become psychologists, how to help in the change process. Now, I could give you a lot of really hardcore, intense science and graphs and um, research articles about what change really looks like, what factors we need. But I'll tell you, in training psychologists, what is more helpful is an understanding and a roadmap for what to do in the room. And you can have a lot of science, but I, this is how I tell my students, you have all your science over here, and then you have the individual person over here that you're meeting with. Your job is to be the bridge. Your job is to take these scientific insights and things that we know and bridge them and bring them across so that they're actually helpful to the person. It's a lot to do. So what I'm proposing to offer you this afternoon is a way to understand that bridge, a way to think about what you're doing when you're sitting with someone, talking with someone, more than how to understand all of the complex um, psychology. In some ways, psychology is really beautiful. There's a lot to learn from it. But it's also the thing that we do every day, all day. Um, so getting into the weeds on that, I think, could distract from the point. So I'm going to give you a framework and a way of thinking about change and some tools that you can use to, to facilitate that process. With that, I'm going to build on this model that Jonathan Hyde um, came up with and that was expanded upon by um, two brothers, the, the Heath brothers in the book Switch. In the change process, there are three main systems involved. There's the rider. And this is often the only system that we think about when we think about the change process. The rider represents your cognitive and intellectual system. That's the part of you that learns. That's the part of you that thinks. That's the part of you that makes decisions. And when we think about change, this is the part that we think about. You need to understand, and then you need to decide. And that is certainly part of it. Every change, you have to have an understanding, and you have to choose, and you have to develop a path. The writer is needed. But there's a second elephant. There's a second piece, and that is the elephant. The elephant represents the emotional system. And if anything, this is actually the piece of the change process that provides the most power. If you're really going to change, you have to be emotionally on board. Your emotional system has to line up. Your emotional system also has to get, get organized in itself. The two need to work in harmony. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you want to quit coffee. Wow. <laughs> oh, I know. It's an example. Bear with me. Um, you, you intellectually think about this, right? This Lent, I'm, I'm, I'm realizing it's not good for me to be addicted to things, to be dependent. I don't like who I am when I'm decaffeinated. My students don't like who I am when I'm decaffeinated. I need to stop this addiction to coffee. All right, the writer has all the reasons. The writer's very engaged. And you wake up on Ash Wednesday, and the elephant is not on board. <laughs> the elephant has a headache. 
the elephant won't be eating much today. The elephant may also be stressed about a variety of other things. That writer can shove and white knuckle and yell at that elephant and potentially be successful, right? Go down the road and maybe last a couple weeks of Lent with no coffee. But if they worked together, you could actually stop wanting coffee. You could live a life apart from coffee. I'm not saying that you have to, I'm not advocating for it. I'm simply acknowledging that it is a path that you can go down. Does this make sense how they can work in concert? Okay. Um, there's also a third level and that's the path. Where are the elephant and the rider going? And you can think about the path in two ways. Where are the elephant and the rider? They are off in coffee land, drinking away a pot just to themselves, and where they want to be. If you want to help someone change, you need to gauge all three elements. The person needs to understand where they are, where they want to be, why they want to be there. They need to have an emotional investment. They already have an emotional investment in where they are, but they need to have an emotional investment in where they're going. The elephant has to want to go there. And there has to be a there for them to go. There has to be a path. The path represents both the end point and the goal, but it also represents those things that are involved in the larger change process. So for example, it involves social groups. Social groups can become part of our path. You can think about converting, right? Someone who is not Catholic has a whole social group who's likely also not Catholic. But part of what can be appealing and what can, what can be appealing is that you get to join a new family, you get to come along to a new group. But what can be painful is that you might have to leave behind your group. It might change your relationship to your group. So that the old path has things that continually pull the rider and the elephant back. And the new path has barriers that prevent a lot of progress, even if there's a decision and even if there's a motivation. Um, now I think, Oh yes, this is what I'm trying to say here. I want to acknowledge that grace can work on all three. And there's no clear role of where the soul fits into the elephant rider and path metaphor, so bear with. But I think that that is something that you can identify and work with. What I have found in my own work is that God will send and soften different elements at different times. So he will loosen the heart so that the fear is not so overwhelming that the elephant can't move at all or he will open the mind to recognize that there are in fact other options. Before you can change, you have to recognize that there's another way to be. There's another way to go about these things. And God can also work incredible um, acts simply by opening the path, by removing barriers, by drawing attention to the path. I think that's important to remember that not only do you need to think about these systems, but you can also be mindful of where grace is working so that you can cooperate with that grace and you can maximize it. I think it begs the question though, where do you start? What is most important? I bet as you think about this, each of you has a preferred entry point, right? And perhaps you've talked about them or will talk about them in this conference, that it's about the path. If you cultivate the path, the rider and the elephant will find it quite attractive and will start going down. It's true. I think a lot of the time we think about the writer alone, that if we convince them, if we show them this the truth, if we point out how bad everything else is, that that will work. I think it's good to know that, but I also want you to reflect that each person approaches change with a preferred access point. You have a preference for where you like to work, but those you work with have a preference for what helps them start the journey and they can be different. This is hard for my students. A lot of my students are like, no, I'm gonna explain psychology. I'm gonna explain everything. I'm like, okay, yeah, you wanna go through the writer. You wanna go through the head. They might need you to just be, go through the emotions. They might need someone to understand and feel with. If you capture the elephant, the writer will come. And then the writer will be interested and want to know. So I highly recommend that you gauge both. You look at all three systems in terms of like, What's going on? What's the thing that I want to change? How do they think about it? How do they feel about it? What's the path? Think about how you feel like you can help the most. If you have more to offer the writer, for example. But also think about what does the person need? 
what is their preferred way of beginning change? You can talk to them about how have you changed things in the past? Well, first I had to really feel like a change would be helpful. All right, and that was because everything was really soured. I was really struggling and that opened me up. But think about it on those different levels. So what do you do? Each of the three levels has different intervention styles that they need, right? The writer needs direction. If you're going to try and help someone change, you have to direct the writer. You need to provide a reason. First of all, you need to provide a reason that something new is possible. It is possible to have a different kind of relationship with God. For example, that has to be, the writer has to start to understand this. The writer needs direction, which can be very concrete, um, but also just a sense of like, where am I going? What am I building towards? And why? Why am I building towards that? The writer also needs to be understood. They, the writer has his own reasons or her own reasons for the path that they're on. So not only do you need to help them see and recognize other ways of being, but you also need to understand and listen to the writer first. Then the writer will listen to you. The writer also needs support in their ability to choose. One of the big barriers for the writer is the sense that I have no control, I have no power, I can't do anything. So something that's very helpful is to say, no, you don't have complete power control, and for the record, neither do I, but there is some room for you to choose. You can learn, you can come to know these things, and I can help support you in that process of choosing. Now the elephant needs something different. The elephant needs motivation. Here, what you can do, this is kind of harkening back to this morning, this is the responsiveness element that we need and that is so important for children. In some ways, the demanding end of those axes can apply to the rider and to the path, but the elephant needs responsiveness. So the elephant needs to discuss the benefits of changing. Why on an emotional level is, is change going to pay off? How can I motivate you to start realizing this piece? And can you really, at some level, soak into that? Start to really see how it would be and feel to be in a different place or to be behaving differently. And that can come with a, a balance of reflecting on the benefits and the consequences. Sometimes the, you have to demotivate the elephant from going along the path they've been stuck on by highlighting what's painful about that, while also showing how a new path can be consoling, although difficult. Again, this elephant needs support and consolation. We need responsiveness. If the elephant is understood and unafraid, they're far less likely to bolt. The elephant also tends to have a lot of fear. It's important to name what they're afraid of in the change, why they're afraid of it, and how you will manage these fears if they come up. You're kind of doing a twofold soothing and calming the elephant while also motivating and encouraging. The path needs to be shaped. So like I said before, first of all, you have to recognize that there is a path, a new way of being, a new way of engaging in the world. Um, very obviously with um, clients who have depression, part of how depression works is it can really lock you in almost like blinders. And so the idea of living without depression is almost ludicrous. When, especially when you're in a highly depressed state. And so one thing we have to do as clinicians is really open up the reality of that path and help someone see and help them believe that that's possible. And I imagine that that parallels quite a lot in the spiritual realm, whatever spiritual depression could be, but this idea that you're very trapped and stuck and there's no way to move. You have to introduce that there is a path and that you can go down it. You also have to identify and remove barriers. And these can come in all different forms, but perhaps it means that you need a new social group, right? Because the current group will keep you doing what you're doing, or you need a new schedule, or you need a new um, spiritual practice. I'm not quite sure, but there's always going to be a barrier in the path. And it's important to identify what those barriers are and, and problem solve around them. Similar to finding the path, the path has to seem possible. You have to create a plan. 
And one thing that I think we make a mistake of is we who are not about to take the journey like to see the whole path. We, we find it very exciting to think about like, holiness, you're gonna become holy, this is so great, and it is. But when you're looking up that mountain, it looks very long, <laughs> very overwhelming, and the smallest step doesn't look like it makes much of a difference. So when you're shaping the path, create a, you have to build small steps, you have to break it down. The elephant is far less likely to bolt when you're only asking it to do this much. And the rider is far more able to believe that this is possible and that they can take it on if the path is small and manageable enough. So that's something to kind of balance out. When I'm talking about building a relationship with God, I'm not talking about you falling into rapture, although if you do, interesting plot twist, but here we go. Um, I'm talking about you taking five minutes to pray. God, could, God will do his work with that. But your work and what you need to do is take those five minutes every day. The elephant is far less likely to bolt. They're still going to have anxiety. The, the, the elephant is still going to struggle. But the writer has more control in that situation. And can, the reasons can be more motivating. So you have, to, you have to shape the path in a way that it can start to go down. And the path becomes self-reinforcing. So that the more you success you have, the more you're likely you'll keep going. Building habits is another great approach to this. And what I would say is called recruiting the herd. That part of what can be so painful and difficult for the rider is not having any example of someone going down this path and feeling like you have to go down this path entirely on your own. Models, examples, and accompaniment on that side of that path make it more manageable for the elephant, help us realize and see that the path is actually possible and help the rider feel like there are resources they can reach out to when they're struggling. So one way that I simply do this, I can't really recruit the herd in, in individual therapy where it's all confidential and I'm not allowed to talk to anybody. But here's a couple of ways that I do it. I tell people, which is the truth, that I've worked with other people who've experienced similar troubles and I've seen them heal. This path has been trod before. I have walked down this path with people before. You are not alone. I also recruit the herd as a clinician by listening for and paying attention to people in their life who are helpful. And I tell them to go hook their elephant up to their elephant. I tell them to walk down this path together. This is how you recruit the herd. I also listen for people who are encouraging and pulling the person to stay on a painful path that doesn't help. And I do the opposite of recruiting the herd. <laughs> I encourage distance and I encourage kind of reflection on that piece. So let's talk a little bit about factors that impact change. There are barriers that exist for the rider. Uh, I do do, I don't currently do group therapy. The question is about how group therapy could fit in with um, the recruiting the herd. Um, I don't currently do it. I have done it in the past and it's very similar. It is a recruiting of the herd um, approach. Um, there's a lot of complexity there. I can get excited. So I'm going to nip off my answer there, but absolutely. So one of the barriers for the, uh, the writer is in fact your mindset. And um, I didn't say here, but Carol Dweck has done an incredible amount of research on this. And I'm going to try and summarize it quite quickly. People approach growth, learning, change, and success with largely two main mindsets. The first one is a fixed mindset. Someone with this mindset believes that talents and ability are innate. You have the IQ that you have, and that's all you get to work with. It's very much a have or a have not. You'll hear this a lot. And some people are just holy and others aren't, right? Black or white. They believe that effort is a bad sign. If something is hard, it means I don't have it. So it's wasted energy. Mistakes are a source of shame and discouragement. Again, I don't have it. The energy isn't worth it. All I'm gonna to prove to everyone and to myself is that I don't have what it takes. I'm not smart enough, I'm not holy enough, whatever. They also avoid, deny, or take per feedback incredibly personally. There's a fragility that you hear this, right? If I have it or I don't, then feedback is kind of pointless. It's not gonna really help me, but instead it's going to feel like an attack. In contrast, there's something called the growth mindset. 
This believes that certain things, people are born with different things and other, and we all have a variety. However, learning is what is key. Right? We all start in different starting places, but we're able to learn and to grow. In which case, effort is a necessary part of that process. People with a growth mindset are remarkably more persistent than those without it, because they do believe that effort is normal and effort pays off. Mistakes are seen as a part of learning. And more than that, they're seen as a place where you actually get to learn more. If I mess up and I look at this, not only can I learn more about what I'm trying to grow in, but I can learn about what I did wrong so that I can grow even more. And in terms of feedback, they tend to be largely curious and open, and they see it as necessary for learning. Now, just like before and this morning, I'm kind of talking about these in the extreme, and they don't always appear this um, cleanly in real life, but as you sit with someone, you'll, try, you'll start to get a sense that really feedback ends up being quite, they quite, feel quite fragile, and it becomes very paralyzing. Here's the important part. These are self-fulfilling prophecies. If you have a fixed mindset, you feel fragile and inflexible, and that impairs your ability to learn. You're less likely to put in effort because it doesn't do anything in your mind, and therefore you're, not, you're less likely to get the results, which ironically confirms the very thing that you started with, that you don't have it. In contrast, in a growth mindset, you are flexible. You do see this as a growing and learning process, so you're more likely to put effort in. And that effort is more likely to pay off. And then it confirms this idea that you can grow. And it starts this upward cycle. Now here's the wonderful thing. Carol Dweck found that you can teach someone mindset. In fact, I've just done it. Now you know about it. Now you can take an internal inventory and think about where do you fall with this? And the reality is, is that we're all capable of the growth mindset, but we have to put ourselves into it. We have to know that it's a thing, to realize that it's not true that things are fixed, but it's true that our mindset can be fixed. So if you switch your mindset and you start to realize that spiritual growth is just that, it's a growth process. It requires effort. It's inevitable that you're going to make mistakes. You need feedback. This is how you learn. It's uncomfortable, but that's part of the process. It's grist for the mill. If you put someone into a growth mindset, not only will they grow, but they will grow at a far more rapid pace than they would on their own. In contrast, if you put someone in a fixed mindset, they will rapidly decline. If you haven't examined your mindset, you'll kind of muddle along and you might switch between the two and things like that. But if you get put into one of these mindsets, your trajectory kind of branches off in two different directions. So whose mindset am I talking about here? I'm talking about all three. Your directee or the person you're accompanying has a fixed or growth mindset about themselves and their spiritual progress. They also have a perception of whether you see them with a fixed or a growth mindset. And the reality is you do see them with either a fixed or a growth mindset. But God's also involved in this process, but his is more set. God has a growth mindset about both of you. If you look and you read the scriptures in this way, you will just see how much is about growth and the journey and mistakes and feedback and resilience. And all three levels make a difference. She did experiments with students. She put them in a fixed mindset and a growth mindset, and they had that split trajectory. She took teachers. She didn't tell in them anything about, the students didn't know anything. She just gave them a random group of students. And if the teacher had a growth mindset, those students did far better. Even though the students weren't told anything about this, nothing was different in them. And if you taught with a fixed mindset, then, you, then your students actually did a lot worse. So you can combine these effects on these three levels. You need to maintain a growth mindset about those you accompany, and you need to help them maintain a growth mindset about themselves. One of the biggest barriers for the rider is if the rider has a fixed mindset about themselves. 
look for it and provide even just a simple explanation. There's some great TED Talks about it to help them see how a growth mindset can shift the way they're thinking about growing in their spiritual life and it can help move them along. And I will tell you, she's done a lot of research and I get very excited about it. Um, but um, she does this about marriages and people having fixed or growth mindset about their marriages and about their partners and it makes a tremendous difficulty, uh, difficulty. it overcomes tremendous difficulty. And that, so that can apply to the spiritual relationship and people's relationships with God. What are some barriers for the elephant? There's this cycle of avoidance that can come up. There's a lot of barriers for the elephant, but one thing that I want you just to be aware of is the cycle of avoidance. Something happens that makes us feel fear, anxiety, worry, and discomfort. And we tend to go for the thing that will shut those feelings down the fastest. And I will tell you, avoidance is one of the best immediate relief measures that you can take but it has long-term consequences because the next time you face those feelings, you face a trigger that comes up, because you've avoided it last time, you now have less confidence in your ability to manage that thing. And it spirals down. The more you avoid, the more confidence you lose and more of the sense that avoidance is the only way you can do something. You have to flip the cycle. And this is where the growth mindset comes in. You have to face whatever's causing you fear and anxiety and discomfort and acknowledge that you're going to face it imperfectly. And once you face it, you won't feel better. <laughs> but after a little while, you'll be able to look back and say, you know, I'm kind of proud of myself. I'm kind of impressed that I didn't die, for example, or, um, you know, that, you know, I didn't, people have fantasies of what will happen when they face fear. One of the ones I hear is I'll run screaming out of the room. I didn't run. I did just go incredibly pale and freeze. And that was embarrassing, but I didn't run out of the room. Like there's always something that you can find to be proud of. And so you build this upward cycle where instead of avoiding, you face, you find something to, and then that building competence, in fact, makes the fear less and less and less each time. I'm gonna talk for a second about barriers for the whole system. And I know that there's a lot of questions, and I will say that this is a whole other talk, but mental health disorders are barriers for the whole system. Depression impacts all three levels. Anxiety impacts all three levels. So what I'll say here is if you notice that there's a kind of stuckness, it's a very um, kind of absurd way of describing mental health disorders, but you have tools, you have strategies, you have things, and we'll talk more about those, that help move someone along. But if there's this perpetual stuckness, whether it's in one area or globally, you're probably talking about something that falls within a mental health disorder category. So beware of that. So now I wanna kind of pivot and talk about strategies and tools for facilitating change. And I heard a little that you talked about this yesterday, but I highly recommend setting a frame. To begin any kind of helping relationship, you need to clarify so that you're educating the rider about this process of helping, you're shaping the path, and you're preparing the elephant. Setting the frame is like a frame for a house. You can fill the house however you want, you can decorate it however you want, but the frame is essential. That involves clarifying roles, who I am, what it means, what I mean in this role, what work, what service I provide. Who does what work? How you know when things are working, what do we do if something goes wrong or isn't working? And boundaries. If you've done the things before, the boundaries should be clear. Not always, not perfectly, but in certain sense, if I know who I am and you know who you are in this relationship, if I know the work that I'm supposed to be doing and you know the work that you're supposed to be doing, we can maintain those boundaries. I highly recommend that you start by setting the frame. And I, I do this a lot. I do this with my students. I clarify what it, who I am to them as a director, who they are to me as their staff. I do it again when I'm their supervisor. What does that mean? And I do it with my patients. I did it with you today. I set the frame by clarifying that I'm not a theologian. I, I set the frame by telling you what I am here to talk about, things like that. 
The number one factor in all of therapy that leads to healing is a therapeutic relationship. And I bet the number one factor in what you do will be the relationship. This is the thing that helps the elephant most of all. For things to be productive, for you to help someone change, you have to help them feel safe and secure with you. Moreover, a relationship is a space for modeling. You can show the elephant that your own elephant has gone down this path and was, wasn't pretty and stomped on a lot of things and you know, yada, yada, yada. But elephants have done this before. Again, like I talked about this morning, that relationship should balance high expectations and standards, demandingness, with support and nurturance. That means you don't have to compromise on your belief that this person can become holy. It's called to great things. But you also need to support and scaffold and help them get there. Um, and here there's another place where you can recruit the herd. That it can be your relationship, but also your relationship in um, concert with other strong supportive relationships. When you're investing in this change process, you need to have the tools to explore and understand where the person is, why they're on the path that they're on, but how they think and feel about the other options in order to guide the rider, the elephant, and then also determine the path. One of the most concrete ways of doing this is depends on how you ask the questions. A lot of what you do is to take inventory. You know, I need to get to know you. I need to know what's going on in your life. I need, you know, you, you need information, right? Well, you need to also know how to pull for information. And there's big differences. Closed questions can be directly and simply answered, typically yes or no, or the statement of a fact. Where is the bathroom? It's over there. Um, they do not invite or encourage exploration, explanation, or deeper consideration. So let me be clear on that. You may be intending to invite deeper exploration and explanation, but if you ask a closed question, the person who's probably a little nervous, their elephant's a little skittish, is just going to give you the simple, most direct answer to end the conversation right there. What you need to do instead is think about asking open questions. They're answered in a free form manner. There's, you can still ask yes or no questions for the record. Some of my students are like, I, I didn't ask a single yes or no question. Okay. But we also do need to know where they live. So please, <laughs> if you could. Um, but they're phrased in such a way as to invite greater disclosure, reflection, and emotional consideration. For example, do you have any questions is far different than what questions do you have? Right? What questions do you have? I've already assumed that you do. But here I'm inviting you to tell me what they are. Are you afraid? Yes, no. What might you be afraid of? Do you need help? How can I help you? There's so many great YouTube videos about this one. I highly recommend that you Google them. It's, it's pretty easy to kind of find good resources, but I just want to introduce this idea to you that how you ask a question can greatly change the answers that you get. The next thing is empathy, to which I imagine you're responding a little like this. The therapist is asking, how does that make you feel? And it's true, I'm being a complete cliche right now. But instead of kind of verbally explaining it to you, I'm going to appeal to your writer. So let's see if I can get this going by finding where my mouse goes over here. Um, okay. I want you to watch this interaction between a mother and a child, and then I will tell you why empathy is so important based off of this. She's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I mean, like a girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby. The baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world, and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly 
picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. Okay. I know it was a little bit of a joke, but that's what happens in neglectful parenting. That when there's no responsiveness, it's the still face experiment the, your whole childhood. Yeah, that's kind of a sobering comment, sorry. Um, okay, uh, let me get back here. I don't know, I didn't realize it would create such chaos. Let's see, okay. When you don't give empathy, when you don't resonate on an emotional level with what the person is saying and talking about, you are the mother with a still face. Okay, we're adults, right? We don't need it in the same way that that baby does. And we can regulate ourselves in a much more savvy way than that infant does. But at the same time, what happens inside of us is exactly what happens in that baby. You start to respond immediately. You know when someone is misattuned with you emotionally. And eventually, if it lasts for very long, and what we saw was maybe 30 seconds, 45 seconds, you become frantic inside. Your elephant is so spooked that the rider has no control, there's no sense of the path, and it will do whatever it can take to get away from this distressing experience. This is why empathy is so powerful. It's because the absence of it is excruciating. It's inhumane. It doesn't mean that you can only talk to the elephant and that you have to appeal to the person's emotions and the emotions are the primary thing all of the time, but it means that the elephant is real and the elephant needs attention. And so in your conversations, you have to intend to emotions. So what is empathy? There are two main parts. The first part is that you have to imaginatively identify, and, and these are uh, true slides that I just borrowed from what I teach my students. So, this is all that therapy do, therapists do this, you can do this too. You imaginatively identify with the person's experience at a cognitive and emotional level. You close your eyes and you put yourself into their imagination and you imagine what they're thinking and feeling. Oh yeah, sorry. Sorry everyone. There we go. And then, you give verbal empathy. These are the steps that you need in that order. What is verbal empathy? It's quite simple. You say what the emotion is and you say why they're feeling it. This is an example I use with my students, it's really cheesy. Someone says to you, I really like your enthusiasm and how you cheer me up when I'm up down or upset. What are they feeling? gratitude, uplifted, cared for. You can respond by saying, you feel so grateful. What are they feeling? Why? You feel so grateful that I can help you feel better when you're hurting. There I've been sneaking. I've identified both motions that are in there, right? There's the gratitude and they're being cared for, but there's also the deeper emotion that they have felt hurt. They have been struggling, and I've empathized with both. What are they feeling, and why are they feeling it? I don't know what God wants from me. Now, based on each person, you'll have a better gauge of the emotions that can come up, but there's a lot here, right? They can feel confused. They could feel lost. They could feel scared, or they could feel angry. 
you'll know when you're sitting with the person. We're naturally empathic. We tune into this, as you saw in that um, exchange between the mother and the child. But you can say something to the effect of, it's incredibly confusing to feel like there's no clear communication between you and God. Then you can go on to say, but I think he is clearly communicating with you. <laughs> or there's some, you know, you can, it doesn't mean that you have to end with empathy. But if you start there, you're going to have a more fruitful discussion. The next thing I recommend is that you listen for patterns. It's a lot of kind of what I've been talking about today altogether. We're natural meaning makers, and we use those internal models that I talked about this morning to make meaning, but we're not necessarily good at it. So you want to listen for both. What is the meaning that people make? How, and how they think about themselves, the meaning they attribute to themselves. What is the meaning and the way that makes sense of God and of other people and of relationships? And how do they make sense and put meaning on the future? If you listen for these patterns, then you can identify where they might be making mistakes, where they might need more education, why you, where you can soothe the elephant by telling them that that you know, thing you're imagining happening isn't imminently around the bend. And when you identify the unhelpful and helpful patterns, then you can intervene. You can shape new paths, new ways of thinking about things, new ways of engaging. But first, I really like to tell my, my students, like, what are the patterns in the way that they think? Where do their stories end regularly? What are the emotions that are coming up over and over again? What are the frustrations? Listen for patterns. The next thing I would add is that there is a value to homework. And some of you are cringing and some of you are the people who asked, you know, weren't you gonna assign us homework? But the reality is, is that change can be an incredibly abstract process. And they can come to insights, but how to actually journey down the path is a whole other thing. Assignments, tasks, and homework help us maintain the things that we're learning and actively integrate these things into our lives. And for change to occur, both steps have to happen. Insight is important, but it's insufficient on its own. So I recommend that when you meet with somebody, you collaborate together in how they can take this into their week, month, whatever it might be, so that they can continue to grow. It has to get concrete at a certain level. The path has to be manageable. I want to end by talking a little bit about your own growth. Much of what I have said today all applies to you. You should have a growth mindset about your own ability to learn these skills and develop these mindsets. You bring your own rider, elephant, and path into the room when you're with someone, and you meet, need to be mindful of them. And you need to make sure they're not getting carried away or bullying someone else's elephant or whatever it might be. The metaphor falls apart quite quickly, but here we go. At the same time, I want you to have a growth mindset. These strategies that I ended with are things that are going to take effort. They're going to take practice. But with that effort and practice, you can become quite good at being a helper. I was, a, I was terrible at empathy to begin with. It was quite foreign to me. I was, a very, I was raised in a very cerebral family. I went to a very cerebral school. And I thought that the answer was just to think your way out of feeling, right? Ignore your elephant, you know, leave it behind, walk down the path, you fool. Um, but I had to practice and learn. And the way that I learned empathy, and this is what I tell my students, because I'm modeling here, right? And I'm showing you that I've gone down this path, that I've changed my ways. I learned empathy by watching Law and Order. I love Law and Order. It was 100% my break from all the reading that I had to do. But I got feedback that I really didn't like, that I wasn't offering good empathy. And in fact, what I was doing is I was just trying to convince people to be healthy. <laughs> this is before I was actually working with clients, thank goodness. Um, but I had to practice, so I would watch what I would normally watch, but I would pause it. And I would just name to myself, what are they feeling and why are they feeling it? And I would make myself come up with a response you're feeling murderous rage because <laughs> they cheated on you. You know, like you can start with something really basic and obvious, but I will tell you 
the more you do it, you build this sense of success, right? I'm, I'm breaking the cycle of avoidance within myself by facing something that makes me uncomfortable and feel ashamed in order to master it. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. You're going to ask closed questions. When you do that, afterwards, take some time after you meet with somebody and, and have a set of questions that you ask yourself. What is one question that I wish I had asked differently? What is an emotion that I could have empathized with that I didn't? What are the patterns that I'm hearing? Put the effort in. You will grow in your ability to help and that will help others grow as well. These are the same things that I tell my students to do. They have to videotape all their sessions so they have the extra torture of watching themselves back. But I make them sit and do this. I make them rewrite their sessions and think about, okay, you had a good instinct there. You knew that we needed to get more information. We needed to ask questions about this. So sit and think about a new way to ask that question. What are the patterns that you're hearing? What are the themes of this person's story, the themes of how God engages them? Write them down. The next time you are with that person, that effort will come to mind. Because you did it after, even if it's been a month, you are primed when you are with that person for those themes to come up so that you are better able to notice them in the moment and make use of them. If you put the effort in, you will also grow. And these skills can be mastered, but they take practice. Give yourself the space and time to practice them, and it will become easier and easier. And then you can tell your, the people that you accompany, as I tell my students, law and order paid off, the effort pays off. If you put it in, you will learn how to empathize. My students now, they hear, they watch me practice, I run role plays with them, and I can empathize like this. It's also been 10 years, it makes a big difference. You can get to where I am. You can learn these skills, but you've got to put 10 years worth of work in. Or you can just put in 10 minutes after each session. Or you can watch your next TV show. It doesn't matter. The motions don't have to be profound, or maybe you watch something that's incredibly profound, in which case they can be. But pause it. Practice. You will be very, very pleased with the results that pay off. You will also be incredibly uncomfortable. But both can happen at the same time. All right. Any questions? Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. um, have you heard of the work of Kurt Thompson by any chance? The name sounds familiar, but it's not coming back. Kurt Thompson? Yeah. She, was, she asked if, I, if I'd heard of him. Yes, he wrote a book called The Soul of Shame. Huh. And he talks specifically about the role of group therapy in allowing people to be accompanied by others in the same uh, situation as them, um, like most of the depression. Or, and uh, I've seen miracles when people feel understood by someone who's experiencing the same thing and they're encouraged by that. Um, and since we don't really have the luxury of any of us of working one on one with a lot of people, we work in groups. Um, I think maybe. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how to, how to train our leaders? I mean, I guess in exactly the same way that you're training us right now, but to, to be an independent listener, to allow them to kind of step back and let people minister to each other. So the question is that um, she, you were talking about how your own awareness of the power of group therapy, particularly when people feel alone, hearing that others share a common experience can be very powerful. And how can those of you who are in charge of groups bank on that same resource? My answer is it's complicated. <laughs> um, and, and that's because I am a group therapist. And so when I think about it, I think about like a million different factors that come into play. Um, the reality is, is that you can empathize with something that you have never experienced. Neurologically, we're wired to be able to do this. We have mirror neurons. Um, and that's what you see in the first half of that video with the mother. She is matching and mirroring back to the child what they're experiencing. If you practice and get good at empathy, you can emotionally resonate with what someone is feeling without having shared that experience. At the same time, we need a herd. We do need other people who have gone through the same things that show us that things are possible. I think that those two pieces can happen in group dynamics. 
And so you want to cultivate an environment of empathy where it's okay for elephants to come into the room and be talked about and noticed and fears to be addressed. And it's also okay for people to talk about how they've shared similar things. But I would boundary it, guide it, shape the path so that this is for the sake of moving forward. This is for the sake of building towards something. Because when things, when elephants get in charge and don't have riders, they can run amok, right? So put in the boundaries, put in the framework, so that when someone is resonating and saying, yes, I felt that way, I felt so stuck and trapped, what can happen is they can just sit in that, and the other can be able to be like, yes, I'm also trapped, and then suddenly the whole room is just down. So instead say, okay, when you were that way, what did you do to get out of it? What helped? You're shaping the path so that there's the resonance, but then it's also moving beyond. Mm -hmm. In other words, everybody each week has this opportunity to share their story. So as you're listening to the story, you're hearing a lot of the issues. You're discerning a lot of what's going on in this person. Um, it's incredibly healing to verbalize your story. Mm -hmm. Talking about the power of stories, particularly when combating shame. I think the beautiful thing about stories and something I'm perpetually struck with in my own work is the kind of multiplicity of the way in which the cre being created, fallen, and redeemed can reveal itself over and over and over. And good storytellers have those themes that resonate, and they resonate in our lives every day. For example, so dramatic. Um, what I tell my students is that when you make a mistake, it's a little experience of the fall. When there's a rupture in a relationship, it's an experience of the fall. We're still created for relationship. You're still able to do this work and redemption is possible. And if you listen to stories, you can find all three pieces. There are going to be mistakes, there are going to be failures, there are going to be moments of pain, experiences of sin. There are also going to be moments and opportunities for the resurrection, for forgiveness, and for healing. And if you listen to stories, you can find those themes, and that can really build hope. Yes? Um, I want to know if it's wrong. I mean, is it possible when you're doing counseling at home instead of face to face, um, is there techniques or whatever to help you with demonstrating? Empathy mm -hmm. and uh, doing your uh, your questioning um, mm -hmm. to uh, elicit um, more for them to talk more in a way that's um, not so guarded. Yes. So the question is about how do these things translate to the phone <laughs> or to areas where you're not able to kind of engage on a full body level or in the same room. The first thing that I recommend is your nonverbals. Ironically enough, those are the things that I think you're saying are off the table, but I think in fact, you can bring them back on. Mm -hmm. Okay. My voice is soft and gentle. My family makes fun of me because I have an absolute therapy voice. It's kind of embarrassing. But those things help, right? If I soften my tone and the way that you're hearing me, if I say something like, oh my gosh, that really hurt. I'm, I'm empathizing, but I'm also modeling and showing you that I'm, it's a much different thing than that really hurt. The tone of your voice, the way that you non-verbally engage somebody on the phone can invite greater disclosure. Do not be afraid of silence. I know this morning I made you a little afraid of it with my blank slides, but wait someone out. Give them the space. And if they say, like, what are you doing? Why aren't you talking? You say, well, I felt like there was a lot more to what you were saying and I wanted to make sure you had room to say it. I really want to listen to you and hear where you are before I tell you what I think. It'll be useless if it turns out I think you're in a place that you're not. I think it's okay, like I said this morning, to name things as they are. Meaning, you know, I really wish I could show you with the way that I, I could if we were in person how much I care about you. And so I just want to name that and bring that to your attention right now, that I don't feel as equipped to do that. I also need more information. Can you help me understand that you're simply naming the thing that you want, that you need, 
It also models to the person that they can do the same thing with you. And if they cross a boundary, you go back to the frame and you bring it back in. But I think sometimes we think that there are really profound, sneaky strategies, and sometimes there are. But I'll tell you, honesty and transparency in an empathic way will get you a lot farther than any kind of CIA tactic. Uh, you know, kind of a, it's almost like, I don't know what the buzzword for them, based on their, their personal experience, you know, what's the trigger word. Mm -hmm. And so I have to say, well, okay, I won't use that word, you know, because that's a trigger. So I have to find a different word, you know. I, I said, okay, okay. <laughs> Noted. So the kind of the piece that you're adding in for those who couldn't hear is sometimes you make mistakes and people shut down. And I think the idea is that you want to avoid that as much as possible. You can't. I'm sure that I have done, I have said something or done something in here that has turned all of you off, most of you off, one of you off for sure. We're, we're fallen. We're, we're imperfect. Human relationships are messy. But what you can do is acknowledge it. Ooh, what I said didn't, that, that hurt, that was not okay. Can you help me understand? My, my intention was to do this. It looks like we're actually over here. What happened? And then you can say something like what you said. I, really, I thought that was really lovely, this sense of, okay, that word is painful for you. That's really helpful for me to know. I wasn't aware of that. I will try as much as I'm able not to use that word. I will try and be sensitive around that area. And then what I say is, it's not always on you. It's a shared responsibility in relationships. Relationships are mutual. Please let me know if that happens again. Please let me know if we're in that territory. And if you can't do it in that moment, I understand. But if I have hurt you, if we have made a mistake, if we have done something painful, I ask that when you're ready, you come back to me so that we can talk about it because I would like to learn and I would like to learn how to help you, but I need your feedback in order to do that. There I'm modeling, right? And additionally, I'm modeling how God is, right? That's how God is. He lets us take our time, he lets us come back. It's a very Christ-like way of being with someone. Rose. I love the tap into your love. Uh-oh. So, you know, when you say, mm. It's a great question. The question is, where does the will fit in with the elephant, the rider, and the path? I would say that the will, kind of in that example, fits within the rider. That the will, in a very Thomistic sense, um, is the accompaniment and the faculty that goes alongside with reason. And so that the will notices something, reason understands it, and then the will can choose it. But like I said before, that's kind of a tendency to have a white knuckle approach and to think that just simply choosing everything is sufficient. We have hearts, and hearts are very much at the center of who we are, and our call throughout the, um, theology is a call to love. And so that all three need to work in harmony as much as is possible on this end of things. But the, so that's why I talked about supporting the person's choice, helping them see that you can choose something here. And I'm not saying it's going to be easy to choose, and I'm not gonna say that you can make one choice and then it's permanent and you're never gonna be tempted to drink coffee again. You might have to choose over and over and over again, but do not lose sight of the fact that you can choose and that making that choice is important. Does that make sense? Does that answer? Other questions? Are there questions online? Touche. For Rango, the question is practical tips for working with teenagers where you can ask the most open question 
and they can freeze you out. Um, I do, I will say in the, the vein of caveats, I don't work with a lot of teenagers. Um, it, it, not because I don't like them, but because my work took me in a different direction. Um, I do like them. Uh, teenagers aren't often treated as people and that's so desperately what they want. And so it becomes more a part of just showing them at some level that you're fascinated by who they are. Yes, I, I know that we're here to talk about God and that's important. But first, I gotta get to know who you are. And I actually have a much more casual style with teenagers than I do with adults. Where you would say in some ways that I lose some of my boundaries when I'm working with teenagers. And I would argue that boundaries aren't things that you lose. They can be flexed. They should have, they're not just permanent walls. They should have doors and windows, et cetera. Um, but I tend to show them in modeling how I can be comfortable and open about myself. They can be comfortable and open about who they are. Ironically, while they're freezing you out, what they're pulling for you to listen, 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 and they're testing you by saying, I know you won't. So I'm not going to give you anything to listen to. Keep listening. Keep inviting them. What are you interested in? What's going on on your phone? Are you playing this game? I heard about this game. Pursue what they're interested in. Let them be full people. Let them tell you about who they are and how they see the world. And meet them where they're at. So often they feel like people are trying to dethrone their rider, dismiss their elephant. They have a rider, they have an elephant, and they need to be encountered and heard. And if you show them that you want and you care about them, and I would argue that you show them that you find them fascinating, they will tell you everything. It will take time, it will take patience, it will take consistency, but that will work. Because just like the rest of us, they long to be loved. They long to be known. But they've had a lot of difficulty and they're still figuring out who they are. So loving who they are is a little difficult when it's kind of a moving target. Can you hit on something that I just heard you could say? Um, we're not paid to listen to people like you are. Um, and, and that relationship is going to be different. So I just think we need to have a sense of real humility when we're listening to a story. When we're, we're sitting across from somebody who's telling us about the questions about God, questions about their family. And I think that that sense of humility shows through and how much we appreciate them sharing with us. It is a gift to have this relationship with them. And I think that goes a long way to establishing a, a good relationship and, and, and solid uh, uh, mentorship going forward. Mm -hmm. That what that kind of highlighting two pieces there. Um, highlighting the importance of humility in any helping relationship and acknowledging and being transparent in a humble manner with those that you accompany. But also letting them know that you receive and experience this as a gift and as a privilege. And that is absolutely true. I think nothing has transformed my life more than the gift and the privilege of working with my patients, but also working with my students and even this moment, right? Um, you don't have to treat me as any kind of authority. You don't have to listen to me. You don't have to pay attention to what I'm saying, but you do. And that's incredibly generous. And my hope is that I can respond by offering something back. And that's a profound way to encounter and approach the work that you do. It's how God approaches all of us. It's another way of being Christ-like. Everything is gift. Gratitude is the right response. Other questions? Mm -hmm. 
That's a great question. The question is about what is the role of a device, particularly within the context of how each person approaches our relationship with expectations, and that those expectations may not fit with what's actually supposed to happen. This is why I talk about setting the frame, because that can be a place where you start to address and draw out what those expectations are. Tell me what you understand is the role or we'll be doing here. How can we get on the same page? I've been a spiritual director to so-and-so, but I've never been a spiritual director to you. What do you look for? I say, I say this to my patients all the time. Have you had a former therapist? What, what did that look like? What was helpful? What was not helpful? What do you think your role as a client is? What is your role as a student? These draw out expectations that then at the beginning, you can clarify and reframe because there are going to be things that are not on the table. You are not going to be their therapist, for example, although you can be helpful and you can be healing. I am going to be their therapist. And I am not going to be their spiritual director. And so I want to clarify that right up. I do know about the faith and I integrate the faith into my work, but that does not make me a spiritual director. So setting the frame can be a place to clarify expectations, particularly the expectation about advice giving. Now, at the same time, people do need advice. They do need to know what the path looks like. The writer does need to be given reasons. So there is space and room for that. But what I kind of advise, say you're put in this dilemma, tell me what to do. I have no idea, what, tell me what to do. Okay, I'm gonna tell you a couple things that you can do, but what I'd like is for us to collaborate about how to actually do that in your life. Do the things that I say fit. One thing that I tell uh, my students and my clients a lot is, yes, I, I am an expert in some things, but you're an expert in others. You are an expert in you. I am an expert in things scientific, this end of the bridge. I'm not an expert in you. And I can figure out how to accompany you, but this is actually a collaborative project where we both shape how this goes. So I expect, so your job, to come back to the frame, is to collaborate with me, is to take ownership over the process. I can listen and learn about your relationship with God and I can bring insights to the table, but at the end of the day, it's your relationship with God. He's pursuing it with you in a different way than he's pursuing it with me. He's engaging and encountering you and you hold the keys to that in a way that I do not. I'm setting the frame, I'm clarifying the roles, but I'm also giving power back to the other person. Another way to kind of disarm that is like, can we just sit in this place where we really don't know what's going on for a while? Maybe God's just asking us to sit. A third strategy for it is to just acknowledge your own bind. I do this a lot, especially with my students who are like, tell me what to say in the next session. And I'll say something to the effect of, well, I want to clarify first, please do not make the mistake of thinking that I have all the answers. I'm giving you examples from my life, but I certainly don't have all the answers. Um, what I say to my students is, you know, I find myself in a bind here. On the one hand, I could see why it would be really helpful to know exactly what to say the next time you went in that room. On the other hand, I'm afraid that if I keep telling you what to say, at the end of this, I'll have to go in the room and you'll feel like a failure. I'm worried that if I keep giving you advice, that you'll never learn or you won't have the opportunity to see if you can figure this out on your own. How do you propose I solve this bind? And if they say, you give me advice, you give them advice. <laughs> that's, a, that's a reasonable answer. They have a need and you can respond to that need. My students do need me to tell them what to say next. There are moments where I have to be incredibly involved and incredibly directive for the sake of my student and for the sake of the client. But I can still let them know about my bind so that they can realize that there's a larger framework in which they can operate. That you can take advice and you need advice, but you can also figure this out on your own. And that's part of what I want to do with you. I want to help you figure things out on your own as well. I don't know how much time we have. Oh, we're good. One more question? Short question. Short question. Now you're on the spot. <laughs> so, um, well, I'm reminded 
of the last cup of the safe harbor and the mm. path is meant to bring us to that harbor. Does the safe harbor kind of change over time? It's a great question. Goals that are attainable and that would mean the path to change as you're mm. moving. That's a great and question. You get to decide, you know, I mean, I'm assuming we're helping um, so person two decide on their own what their goal is. And are they setting the path? I mean, how does that? How does all of those things work? So let me see if I can get it. So the question is, in light of the earlier discussion about the safe harbor, is the safe harbor the end goal of the path? Is it something different? And do the paths change over time as the person changes? Is that, and does, well, and does the goal of the safe harbor change? And does the safe harbor change over time? Okay, I might need you to keep me accountable to answering all those pieces, but I'm happy to. I think it depends on how you think about it. Um, let's make distinctions and make things messier before they get clearer. The safe harbor I was talking about before would actually be something lived out in the rider and the elephant. This interior sense of we can work together and we can figure things out and we can go do hard things, which is to go walk down a path of hardship or a path of growth and virtue, for example. So we need an internalized sense of safe harbor, which means that the elephant can calm themselves and the rider can feel confident and a sense that they can take on hard things. What I'm imagining and kind of where this is coming from is what I talked earlier about God as a safe harbor, God as a secure base. And I would argue that that is an ongoing project that we all um, go about in our lives. And yet it is something that is already true. God is a safe base to us. He is a place from which we can receive consolation and support, but also a relationship from which we are pushed to grow in more and more ways. It is both the end and the means of the spiritual life in some ways. So I think in some ways, I'm imagining at least that part of what I try to do as a clinician is help my clients come to a place of feeling interior security and safety so that they can take on life's challenges. And I'm imagining that as a spiritual director, you're, you're partially doing something like that, right? Giving them a sense that their relationship with God can be safe, it can be secure, and it will continually push them to grow. And that from then, God will ask more and more and more of them. The more you get to know that guy, the more he asks. <laughs> and the more you learn that you can do it, right? He has this growth mindset for you. And so in that way, the, the path can change. And paths can also be shut off. And that, is, that involves and requires a kind of grief. And you can't get stuck in that grief process forever. I mean, you can, but you shouldn't, you shouldn't because there is another path that you can take. So even if you've gone down a path for a while, sometimes you have to grieve that it's not the one that you thought you were going to do the whole time, but you've still learned a lot. There's still some lesson in there that will equip you to go down another path. And perhaps all you learned is that your rider and your elephant could go and work together as a team. And what an incredibly valuable lesson that is. Does that answer? I think you've asked a very big question. So I think in some ways it has to be, no, I think you're asking the right question, but my answer is going to be uh, unsatisfying in certain levels. All right, thank you all so much. It was lovely to be with you. <laughs>